5,000 years ago, changes were afoot on the windswept steppes north of the Black Sea. Changes that would alter all of human history and bring about a revolution for the future of mankind. Hello, this is Harold Halfdan, and welcome to Archaeological Minecraft. I'm a former archaeologist who enjoys playing Minecraft and thought it would be fun to combine the two. In today's episode, we're going to talk about and build some structures from the steppes people who domesticated horses and played an instrumental role in the rise of the Bronze Age. The cultures and people we'll be talking about today are called the Batai and the Yamnaya cultures. The Batai culture is a prehistoric people that lived in North Central Asia in the area that's now modern Kazakhstan from around 3700 to 3100 BC. To put that date into perspective, that's around 1000 years before the Great Pyramids of Egypt. The name of the Batai culture comes from the modern settlement of Batai in Kazakhstan, where an ancient site of 153 pit houses from these people were found. I'm going to build a couple of those pit houses so you can get a flavor of what they looked like while I talk about this fascinating culture. But first, before we start jumping right into that, let me tangent for a moment and talk a bit about horses as they play a central role in the development of both the Batai and the Yamnaya cultures. Back during the last ice age, sea levels were different from what they are today and the land bridge of Beringia still existed that connected North America and Asia. It was during that time that horses migrated and spread from their native land in North America and as humans traveled from Asia to North America over that bridge, horses migrated the reverse traveling from North America to Asia. After the Ice Age and sea levels rose separating the two continents, horses would eventually become extinct in North America but would thrive on in the steppes of Asia. For thousands of years, horses would be hunted for food by the inhabitants of the steppes just like any other large herbivore. Jumping back forward in time to the Batai culture, it isn't clear if they were interacting with horses in a truly domesticated capacity or if they were just leveraging captured and tamed horses. The difference there is that when you tame an animal, you're capturing specific individuals or groups of individuals and keeping them in a way that they can't or won't escape. Whereas when an animal is domesticated, that indicates a permanent genetic modification that has occurred to predispose the animal towards human association. So, while it's clear that the Batai people kept and penned horses, they might have just done so to keep a locally available food population so there wouldn't be a need to always go hunting for that food and maybe they rid those tamed horses as well. It also might be that over time those tamed horses took on a domesticated quality. However, when you look at the genetics of the horse bones found on the Batai sites, they can be most closely tied to Shavalsky's horse, otherwise known as the Mongolian wild horse. That breed's considered today to be the only remaining wild horse population where it contributed 2.7% ancestry into modern domesticated horse populations. So it doesn't seem that modern horses descended from that lineage, but rather from a now extinct different lineage. Other wild horses today are feral domesticated horses. So it seems like the horses the Batai cultures were keeping might have been tamed Shavalsky's horses or came from a similar stock and then perhaps reintegrated back into that wild population. Jars and powdery found on the site shows evidence of horse lipids, or in other words, horse fat in them, which previously led some to conclude that they were using horses for their milk. However, more recent analysis of Batai culture's teeth doesn't back up that claim. When analyzed, the teeth showed that dairy wasn't present in the dental remains, nor were domesticated grains found. Instead, archaeological evidence shows mostly the Batai survived off horse meat, roots, and tubers. Okay, so as I've been talking all about horses, you've been watching me build some examples of that Batai culture's pit houses. So let me walk you through them. A pit house is a dwelling where the living space of the house is located underground and was constructed by digging a pit, as the name implies, a meter or so under the ground. In the case of the Batai pit houses, a short wall was built around the pit and then long straight poles were laid to form an octagon shape and rotated so they could be supported by the previous layer. This formed a cone-shaped roof which would have been covered by thatch or turf as I've done in my recreation here to help the rain run off the roof. The benefit of this kind of dwelling is that it didn't take a lot of permanent or expensive resources to create and could have been made 
from what was around the inhabitants on the steps using rocks, wood, turf, or long grasses, and by being a pit house, that helped shelter the inhabitants from extreme weather and cold winds and warmed by the hearth within, while also helping keep food stores cooler and lasting longer by being stored underground, where they could be kept in a more stable temperature and preventing spoilage. Another early culture that was critical in the process of domesticating the horse was the Yamnaya culture. The Yamnaya, otherwise known as the pit grave culture or the ochre grave culture, after their practice of burying their deceased within pit graves that were covered over with kurgans, otherwise known as barrows, grave mounds, or tumuli, lived in the Pontic Caspian steppes north of the Black Sea and Caspian Sea around 3300 to 2600 BC. The Eurasian steppe, just to put that into perspective, is around 8 million square kilometers or around 3 million square miles. And to put the time frame I talked about into perspective, the Batai, if you recall from earlier in the episode, date to around 3700 to 3100 BC. So the Yamnaya were about 400 years after the Batai, with some of the potentials of those cultures overlapping for a time. This was also just before the time to the Great Pyramids of Egypt, which were around 2600 BC, so right at the end of the Yamnaya culture time period. The Yamnaya were a highly successful and expansive culture and spread all the way from the steppes north of the Caspian Sea and spread to the west even as far as modern-day Romania. Others have tried to trace the spread of the Yamnaya peoples through Indo-European linguistic analysis, as well as trying to trace genetics, which show even more cultural and population migrations going so far as Scandinavia in the northwest to parts of India to the south of their homeland. It was with the Yamnaya that we first start seeing dairy being used from horses, which plays a critical role in helping add a dense calorie source into their diet. And even more importantly, it was transportable and spoilage resistant. It was also during the Yamnaya that you start seeing the use of domestic grains being used by steppe cultures, or at least being consumed by steppe cultures. The Yamnaya were semi-nomadic, meaning that they would travel seasonally depending on the needs of their pastoral herds of goats, horses, sheep, and cattle, perhaps spending winters hunkered down and living in the forested river valleys of the Great Steppe river systems, or up in the highlands where maybe there was grass for their herds, and then spending the summer months perhaps migrating with their great herds into the great grassy and lowland areas of the steppes. So to give an example of what perhaps their dwellings are thought to have been, here are some examples similar to the yurts used by more modern and historic peoples of the Great Steppe, such as the Mongols. A yurt is a temporary tent-like structure that has a framework of poles and an outer shell of hides and fabric that could be stood up or taken down rapidly as the steppe peoples follow their herds and bring them to fresh grassy areas to graze. I don't know exactly how large the Yemnaya yurts were, but for this recreation, I made mine about the same as the more permanent pit house dwellings that I made earlier in the episode when talking about the Batai. More modern Mongolian yurts can often hold up to 15 individuals, so can get larger than what I'm recreating here. Here. Up to this point in the episode, I've mostly focused on horse domestication of these people, but if you recall from the title, I said something about a Bronze Age Industrial Revolution. So what was all that about? Well, it was during the Yemnaya, and likely on account of their semi-nomadic lifestyle, that the transition from the Stone and Copper Age was helped along to the Bronze Age in civilizations like China and the Middle East, as well as with the Yumnaya. You see, the areas that the Yumnaya lived are not simply vast open steppes, but also contain some of the world's richest sources of copper and tin, the two ingredients needed for the forging and creating of bronze. It's estimated that just one of their mines might have produced 10 times the amount of those metals than the amount being mined from the other ancient sources of those metals, for instance, in Central Europe, which was the next most rich area for mining Bronze Age metals. And that comparison was just a single mine, and archaeologists have discovered six or seven more mines just like that. Scientists have looked at ice core samples that show layers from that time period 
and have found an uptick in carbon and other pollutants contained within them, which has led some to postulate that perhaps all that wood, charcoal, and other associated felling of trees to fire the furnaces used to create all that bronze might have led to some amount of climate change for the Bronze Age societies, although more research needs to be done in that area. So let me paint the picture on this trading network I talked about between the Yumnaya and the peoples around them. Basically, they started an ancient Silk Road around the trading of bronze and those technologies. A lot of the bronze used in Mesopotamia and really early China was coming from the rich copper and tin mines and traded for grain and other products. And so the sedentary civilizations that surrounded the steppes with China in the east, Indus Valley to the south, and Mesopotamia, Greece, and Egypt to the south and west utilized the transportation and connections often unknowingly to one another through the steppe people's trading connections. Beyond the physical metal being traded, the knowledge and different techniques for smelting, forging, and creating tools with bronze was also being traded and shared across from the Yumnaya to the other peoples. I want to make a quick point about the sharing of this knowledge. When you think about the Neolithic or Stone Age, the Copper Age, also called the Chalcolithic or Enneolithic periods, and the Bronze Age, it wasn't as if there was a hard and fast line when a culture or group of people transitioned from one period to another, or one age to another in this case. And you can see iron being used in small quantities throughout the Bronze and even Copper Age, and the same with stone tools in later ages, and you can find copper and bronze being used throughout the Iron Age. If someone had a bronze or copper tool, weapon, or piece of armor and it still worked just fine, they continued to use it. It really wasn't like now where every year people rush out to get rid of their current phone just because there's a later model. It was a much, much longer and overlapping process as things moved from the stone to the copper to the bronze to the Iron Age. Getting back to the spreading of that knowledge across the steppe, it also wasn't just with the development of the horse and mining and trading of copper and tin that the Yumnaya made their technological mark, but some scholars have also theorized that they might have had a hand in inventing or spreading the knowledge of wheeled transportation, such as wagons and chariots. It was these wagons that carried the heavy loads of copper, tin, and bronze across the steppe. In fact, it's migrating on wagons and carts that really should be visualized as well as from horseback. And it was during the Yamnaya period that horseback riding really became a thing, possibly invented by the Yamnaya or the Batai. And horse skeletons from both cultures show teeth that have wear marks from bits being used for the first time. And that bit dates all the way back in the initial state to the Batai culture in around 3500 to 3000 BC. Using chariots for war instead of fighting from horseback remained common though in many areas for thousands of years and in Mesopotamia for example you really don't see cavalry until the Assyrians around 900 BC and even Julius Caesar when invading Britain in 55 to 54 BC spoke of the tribes of Celts in Britain using chariots and so what might have started as a Yamnaya invention i.e. chariots lasted for thousands of years in other places. I mentioned previously that the Yamnaya were also called the pit grave or ochre grave culture and were known for burying their dead in kurgans. So let me talk a bit about that and let's excavate this kurgan I built. The deceased were buried in pit graves lying on their back or sides in an east-west orientation with their head either facing east or west and often with bent knees facing just one direction or with both knees bent up under their body with their legs wide apart. The body was covered with ochre, a yellow, red, or brown pigment made from clay earth with iron oxide in it, which is often derived from extracting tin and copper, the two ingredients used to make bronze. The burials were often accompanied with animal offerings and sometimes anthropomorphic stelae, in other words, stone pillars with carvings that show people. Some of the larger royal kurgans, so much bigger than the one I'm making here, have so many horses buried in them that it's been estimated that the meat that would have come from them would have fed 4,000 individuals. And oftentimes there would have been a feast associated with that burial ceremony. 
Well, that wraps up this video. I hope you enjoyed a little foray into the steppes of Eurasia and the ancient people of the Batai and the Yemnaya. I dropped a bunch of links to resources I used to research this episode, both scholarly as well as some good podcasts that talk about some good background information. And I'd encourage you to check those out if you want to learn more. Make sure that you take the time to like my video if you like them and subscribe and all that stuff. If you want to see more videos from my channel, please check those out as well. Thanks. Have a good rest of your day. Bye for now.